here at all. We don't need to keep track of time. Yeah. Yeah. Our agenda yeah. time is pretty open. Yeah. 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 You're trying to get a new with an accent, so you're trying to get a new with an accent. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, I was getting the accent, so I just copied him off the uh, agenda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
please please feel free. And I'll, I'll be supporting there on Etherpad, so you're not alone. And the blue sheets are going around. Please make sure you sign them. So it is Thursday afternoon. Hopefully you've seen the note well by now. Uh, this meeting is covered by the IETF note well. If you have not read it yet, please do so. It covers things such as patents and what your responsibilities are in the ITF, and also, very importantly, the code of conduct with which this meeting is going to run. So, uh, usual reminders, anytime you talk at the mic, please state your name clearly for the minute taker, uh, and please review the documents that happen in this working group. That way, your documents will also get reviewed and sign the boot sheets. Uh, so here are some links for people following online. Uh, did I get it wrong? Uh, every time. Uh, I, I saw your email. This is silly. Uh, more useful links for people still following online. Um, yeah, quick usual shout out. We have a GitHub organization for the working group. And anyone working on a draft uh, in the working group or that wants to be in the working group is welcome to set it up there. Just talk to us and we can make it happen. Uh, our goals for today, uh, we're gonna have an update on our currently active documents, uh, both in terms of standardization and actual running code. And then we're gonna talk about, uh, about service registration and discovery relay. And we're gonna have fill up the rest of the um, allotted time with the future of this working group and the privacy efforts and where we want to go. Uh, so that's the agenda as currently stated. Would anyone like to bash the agenda? All right, Stuart. Please stand on the pink X, otherwise the Acme Anvil will miss you. This is an update on our push notifications document. We discussed this at the last IETF meeting. We're on version 19. Uh, we had working group last call to review that. Uh, that went smoothly. David requested publication. We had ISG review, last call. We got some feedback, we made some updates, and that's what I'm gonna give a quick overview of you right now. That's weird. No, there's just, that's an extra little thingy popping. Oh, well, no. but yeah, it's, but it's, 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 we need to push a button. Oh, so yeah, there. Press escape. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it was not a media yeah. problem. It was a projector yeah. problem. Ram is cheap. Cycle them to double check. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> okay, so this is the timeline. I don't need to read it out. You can all read. Uh, here's the summary of what's new. We realized that the whole document focuses on the mechanisms of push notification, which is fine. What it neglected to mention is the reality that any client using this, if push notification is not supported, is going to fall back to using the regular DNS query to get the same answer. Uh, that's kind of obvious, but it didn't say that. So we added some text that says, when you do that, you shouldn't poll more frequently than once every 15 minutes. And that's just to give some guidance so that we don't end up with ridiculous burden on servers. Uh, there was also a, a mismatch in the document. Uh, late in the process, the DNS stateful operation, RFC, added some explicit text about when TLS early data is permitted and when it's not, because there can be risks with replay so you only want to use it for idempotent operations. And there is a requirement in DSO that you state which DSO operations are allowed in early data. 
and we had not updated the push draft to include that required language. So we did a bit of thinking and we figured that doing the subscribe is not something that will cause harm if it's duplicated and the performance benefits of saving a round trip may well be worthwhile. So we put in the required text saying, we've considered the security implications and this is fine with TLS early data. So those two are easy. Uh, the big topic was, uh, I think, I hope, a storm in a teacup, but it turned into a long email thread. And what happened here was we had copied text from the DSO document this is based on, where in many places it says, if there's a fatal error, you should immediately abort the connection with a TCP reset or equivalent for other protocols. And in DSO, as in this document, we, are, we may be a victim of trying to be too thorough in stating all of the rare corner cases that should never happen, but if they do happen, what you should do about them. Uh, uh, Martin Thompson has written a draft recently. Uh, the title is something Postel was wrong uh, or something to that effect. It's been renamed to something less controversial. <laughs> Uh, he was mostly he was mostly right about many things, but I happen to agree with Martin Thompson on this one that being liberal with what you accept, particularly for the first implementation of a thing, anything you're liberal about, other buggy implementations will probably accidentally do, and if you accept it, then all those bugs become entrenched, and then you have an ecosystem of lots of buggy code. I think for the first implementation of anything you actually have a responsibility to be strict and reject invalid input because in effect, your implementation is the conformance test. The IETF doesn't have conformance tests and certifications that have to be passed to get to use the IETF logo on your product. So we have very little enforcement of our protocol. In effect, the deployed implementations are the conformance test because somebody coming along to make an implementation is going to test it with yours and if it works, they'll ship it. And if it fails, they'll debug it. So early in the game, I think it's really important to enforce all the things you want to, because anything you don't enforce, you don't get to enforce later. So with that spirit in mind, in many cases, the document says, if you do something completely bogus, then the other end is going to reset the connection. So if a client connects to a server and then sends it a response, that makes no sense tear down the connection. Don't even bother with an error code because that is something that the programmer is going to debug by looking at a packet trace. This is not a runtime error that occurs in the field. This is just a gross programming error and you fix the bug. So there are many cases like that that I think a lot of specs wouldn't even mention. We were trying to be really thorough and we put this text in. Robert Sparks pointed out entirely correctly that DSO is general and could, in principle, run over any transport. For push notifications, we have specified, for now, only TLS over TCP. Uh, running it over something else would be a future document to update this. So Robert said, since it's only for TLS over TCP, you can remove the equivalent for other protocols, because there aren't any. Oh, good point. OK, we'll delete that text. That's easy. Uh, in the ensuing discussion, David helpfully said, well, if you're using TLS, you should send a close notify instead of reset, which for a graceful close is true. But here we're talking about really fatal error conditions that should never appear except in the development process. And hence, a long discussion uh, went on the mailing list and a lot of off mailing list discussion too. I just want to confirm that, yes, I didn't have the full context in that comment. <laughs> Um, so, uh, as a result of this, which was quite valuable, I went back and did a pretty thorough review of all the places in the document where it talks about a reset and worked out what, what the context is. Uh, there was some discussion that instead of tearing down the connection, the server could use the DSO retry delay operation to tell the client uh, you are grossly buggy, 
go away and don't talk to me for half an hour. Uh, there was some debate about whether we can expect a grossly buggy client. The kind of client that connects to you and immediately sends you a response uh, may not process the rest of the protocol as well. So uh, that is a question that we can't answer. It's a speculation about pro implementations that don't exist yet that are very buggy. Uh, there was also lots of discussion about, well, the client can enforce the delay, and that turns out not to be as easy as it sounds because you can't tell. Two, success two successive connections could be from the same client or they could be from different clients behind the same NAT gateway. So, or with IPv6, they could be different privacy addresses on the same device or different devices. The whole point of privacy addresses is to obscure the identity of the client. So if the server can tell it's the same client twice, uh, in a sense, privacy addresses aren't working. So uh, it's hard for the server to enforce that. I also, when I looked through, I found that out of the 12 cases, seven of them are the client tearing down the connection because the server did something bogus. So clearly in the case of the client tearing down the connection, it doesn't need to tell the server, don't call me back because uh, servers are not going to connect to clients. So, so the end result of this is for the seven bogus server messages where the client just gives up on the connection and either tries a different server or waits, uh, those are now back to saying send a reset. Uh, five of them are bogus things the client does. Three of those are the client sending responses to the server, which is so bizarre that if, if you look in most specs, if you look in RFC 1035, there is no language about what to do if a client connects to you and then sends you a response. It's just so silly they don't mention it. Uh, we do mention it, and we say if a client does that, you just give up on the client. Uh, Sending a fin then puts the server in close wait state while it's waiting for the fin to be acknowledged. And if, if there's a client looping doing bad things, that can end up to being quite a resource burden on the server, which is exactly why web servers do not send a fin, because they don't want to have the burden of maintaining that state. Um, so, so the client sending a response is bogus. The client sending a push message is equally bogus because that's a notification which should go the other way. And the last one here is the only one that I think is uh, somewhat uh, debatable. And that is if the client sends two identical subscribe requests. And I want to explain the reasoning why we had the wording like that. Uh, because as I said, we don't have conformance testing in the IETF. My fear is that some developer might get lazy, they're busy, they've got a deadline, and they make an implementation that does not check for duplicates. And you could easily imagine, oh, we'll fix that later, that's not important, right? That'll be a version two feature. Uh, if we don't want that to happen, we have to have some safeguard in place that will cause that developer to say, hang on, no, I can't leave this for version two because my client's going to break. So that is the reason for this, is to be unforgiving about our requirement that clients should suppress duplicates. We do not want a client that ends up sending 100 identical requests to a server because of a bug. And if that happens, the server should protect itself. So that is the summary of the changes. I would welcome any feedback. I would also welcome complete silence because that would indicate there's no disagreement. And of course, uh, we won't make any final decisions here in the room. Uh, you can also comment on the mailing list. Okay, well, I'm really happy that that's uncontroversial, which it should be at this stage in the process. We will go ahead with publication of that. Uh, I also saw on David's agenda, it said, uh, hackathon implementation report. Um, I don't have a slide for that, but I can verbally tell you uh, Ted and Barbara and I had a productive couple of days sitting together working at the hackathon. The code we're working on is on the hackathon GitHub repository. If you go to github.org slash IETF-hackathon, you'll find the MDNS Responder repository there. 
Uh, Ted and I have been working on code. We have running code that you can run on Mac or Linux. We've also been building it for OpenWRT. We have these neat little GL INET home gateways about the size of a pack of playing cards that run OpenWRT. We have pre-built packages for that, so you can try it out. We did demos. Uh, at the hackathon and we also went to the hack demo happy hour on monday and had a table set up there showing it to people you can try this yourself at home because i'm a firm believer in living on software that's how you find when it doesn't work i have now switched to using one of these gli net routers as my default home gateway my mac and my iphone are set to connect to that by default whenever i come home so i'm normally on that network without thinking about it and that GLINet home gateway is running the discovery proxy. It is not forwarding multicast. It is in the normal configuration. It's running DHCP. It's running NAT. There's isolation between the LAN port and the WAN port. But with the discovery proxy, all the stuff I do on my Mac and my phone, printing, scanning, anything else that's using Bonjour Discovery, it just works. And anything that doesn't work, I find it. And then we work on fixing the bugs. So interrupt. Um, and Ted, I think we said that Friday morning we're going to start plugging things together. And if anybody wants to um, build a load and bring a router and plug it together, we're going to be meeting in the code lounge at 10. Was that what we said? Thereabouts ish. And try and plug things together. So you're all welcome to help plug. Michael Richardson, Stuart. So um, if I understood what you just described, um, that you have plugged this device wired WAN port into your existing home network, creating two layers of router. Yes. Okay. Um, and on the, the wireless or maybe the wired port, you now can see the devices which are on your, on your original network. What is nominally labeled the WAN port yes. on the GLI net is plugged into my existing home network. Right. Correct. Just, just wanted to clarify that you didn't, I would say, well, what's the utility if you've just replaced your home router with one of these? There, it's all on the land side. So, what does it mean? I, mean, I got you now. Uh, thanks for the clarifying question. Yes, the, the utility is twofold. One, for me and Ted working on this code, the utility is testing it on a daily basis. Uh, in terms of why anybody else would do this, looking forward to the broader picture of why we're we doing this work at all. One benefit I get of that compared to how my network was is my client devices, my, my laptop and my phone, are doing all their discovery with Unicast. So on the Wi-Fi link where multicast is slow and inefficient and unreliable because it's not acknowledged and very wasteful of shared spectrum because it's sent so slowly, I'm now not flooding lots of multicast traffic onto that Wi-Fi. I'm keeping the Wi-Fi clean doing unicast to the gateway. And then on the gigabit ethernet that can handle tons of multicast, no trouble, I'm still using legacy multicast discovery for the devices on that ethernet. But the client devices on Wi-Fi are not being bombarded with lots of multicast traffic they don't care about. All right, thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ted Lemon. Um, I've been working with Stuart on all this fun stuff. Uh, so one thing about the plug fest on Friday um, is that if you want to come with your OpenWRT device, uh, you probably want to do a build before before then because it takes longer than two hours to do a build. Um, so there's code. Uh, you'll there's a URL at the end of this slide uh, slide deck that that points you to the repository. And uh, you would want to download uh, our fork of OpenWRT and build that uh, rather than attempting to uh, do something more adventurous at the PlugFest. Um, and if you have any issues with that, uh, that's my email address and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, so uh, I actually have, uh, well, I'll just uh, on the introductory slide here briefly, uh, I have three things to talk about. Uh, various different bits of work that we've been working on uh, over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, 
discovery proxy, uh, discovery relay, and service registration protocol. So I'll talk about discovery proxy first. Um, so, uh, so the discovery proxy, uh, I assume most folks here know what a discovery proxy is, but just to recap, a discovery proxy is a device that uh, receives queries using DNS on port 53 and asks questions to answer those queries by using multicast DNS. Um, and so uh, this is a, an important goal for a variety of use cases. The case that dragged me into it was HomeNet. Um, and so we've implemented a nice uh, fully featured DNS SD discovery proxy. Uh, it actually uses uh, MDNS responder to do uh, both DNS lookups and MDNS lookups. And then, uh, so when you send it a question on port 53, it goes out and does whatever it needs to do to come up with the answer using MDNS responder, which is Apple's open source uh, uh, DNS, uh, all singing, all dancing, uh, stub resolver. Um, and uh, so we've implemented uh, listening on port 53 for DNS queries, listening on port 853 for DNS push connections. Uh, so it's a it's a full working implementation of DNS push over TLS, um, and it also does something that I wanted for for uh, uh, HomeNet, and it does it accidentally. Like I didn't actually plan it out this way. I just plan on writing a discovery proxy and then figuring out a way to wedge a DNS server in alongside it. But it turns out that since MDNS responder acts as a stub resolver for DNS and MDNS. Um, that I could just use that for both authoritative service and recursive service. Um, and so this basically is a swap and replacement for, uh, for uh, DNS mask, except that it now does uh, proxy as well. Um, so it's pretty sweet and you can try it out anytime you want. Uh, it runs on Mac OS, it probably run on BSD, uh, but I haven't tried it. Uh, it definitely runs on Linux. Um, and uh, as far as things that can do queries against it, um, pretty much anything uh, out there that does uh, DNS service discovery can use it. Um, however, uh, we also have implementation on uh, uh, various Apple, new Apple devices that uh, will do DNS push. So you get, not only do you get just regular old service discovery, but you also notice when new things show up immediately rather than having to wait 15 minutes for, <laughs> for a retry. Um, and so, uh, and the code for that is in the open source MDNS responder distribution that's on the, uh, the, the GitHub. Um, however, the support for DNS push uh, needs a little bit more TLS glue to work on um, sort of the POSIX side of things. Uh, that stuff's all working on a Mac OS X, but it uses uh, the network framework on Mac OS rather than using sockets. And so that there's a little bit of additional work left to do there. Um, so before I go on to the next thing, does anybody have any comments or questions about this? Sounds like no. Um, okay, so the next thing is Discovery Relay. This is actually kind of old news, but I just wanted to mention it for completeness. Uh, we did a Discovery Relay implementation um, kind of last year. Um, and uh, the purpose of the Discovery Relay is basically to, to do something very much like what uh, DHCP Relay does, to, to provide a really stupid thing that you don't have to update all the time when you add features that can sit in your router or whatever and uh, a full service MDNS uh, resolver can contact it and do MDNS through it to a link that it's not connected to. Um, so uh, some folks have suggested that you could do this with a, with a layer two tunneling program or pro protocol or something like that, and that's very true. And if you have that available to you, you really don't need this. Um, but it does seem like a useful feature for a fair number of use cases. It'll, it takes advantage of IP routing end to end, um, and it doesn't require any special uh, uh, filtering to, to avoid having it open up a, a bridge to services that you don't want to bridge. So, um, so it seems like a valuable thing. It's, uh, we haven't really talked about it in the working group for a while uh, in any detail. Um, there does seem to be some interest from some router vendors. I don't know how serious it is. Uh, it would be nice if we could get to publication. 
Um, but it really depends on whether the working group is actually interested in reviewing the document. If not, uh, probably try sending it through the ISE. Um, so uh, I'm not really inclined to ask the group here to tell me whether they love this thing or not because uh, you know you may or may not have read it. It probably makes the most sense to just talk about this on the mailing list. But I'm bringing it up here so that so that when you see the message on the mailing list, you'll know what the context is. Um, so the implementation, as I said, it's uh, we did it about a year ago. It's on the uh, hackathon GitHub repo, but it's on an outdated branch. Um, I'm in the process of making of modernizing it to use the new code that I've written. Um, and uh, my hope is that that code will be available for you to try out if you want to before Singapore. Comments or questions? Uh oh. My name is Stuart Chasher. I know you said you're not asking for comments on this, but I, I feel I want to share my opinion with everybody. And as co-author on this, clearly I'm biased, but I think the work we've done with Discovery Proxy is very viable to put in open WRT for home gateways. For the enterprise market, convincing enterprise router makers to put this in is a much harder sell and also probably not a good idea because once it's in, it won't be updated until that router goes in the dumpster 10 years in the future. So, uh, and for those who don't know, this was this was Ted's idea and I co-authored the document with him, but it was Ted's idea and it's kind of inspired by the BootP relay, which has been enormously successful for enterprise deployments of DHCP. I think this small, simple, focused piece of code, we have a much better chance of evangelizing this to the enterprise makers who who we want to reach. Way back when this group was chartered, that was one of the goals, was to improve discovery and enterprise uh, networks. So uh, I definitely think we should push ahead. This work is basically done. We just need to adopt the draft, have some people review it, last call, uh, or as you say, go the independent route. I would prefer to do it in the working group. Uh, Tom, made the comment, can't you do this with VLANs? And I think we should add some text about that in the yep. document. If you already have a setup where you have VLANs configured and trunk ports and, and maybe some enterprises actually run their DHCP by having VLAN trunk ports instead of boot feed real agents, I think a paragraph or two discussing the pros and cons of when you might choose one versus the other, uh, that's a useful addition. Uh, and then I think we're ready to publish because we have a fairly mature documents and we have fairly well-tested code. Yep. So to comment on process here, um, this is adopted as a working group document. We had a working group last call already and it failed due to lack of interest. So the issue here is that um, pretty much uh, no one apart from the authors expressed interest in this work uh, with, I think Tom had some comments, but it was very sparse. And what we're asking as, as chairs is for people to comment like, oh, especially like this is aimed at the enterprise market. Is there anyone making these devices that thinks this is useful? Like you don't have to commit to like, oh, I want to deploy this, but just saying that this is useful would go a long way. Yeah. That, that's where we are. We're, I personally, not as chair, believe that this is a good document, but if we want to forward it as a working group item, we'll need more people to speak in favor of this. So you can either do this now at the microphone or on the list, uh, whichever you prefer. Uh, Tim Wattenberg, just a quick comment which came to my mind when Stuart um, talked at the mic. So if this document is intended for enterprise uh, vendors, then those routers or whatever it's supposed to run probably have the ability to do VLANs or something like this. So actually I think we should, yeah, it, it would be interesting to hear if there are good use cases uh, which are not covered by this because, so I don't have a particular opinion about uh, if that's a good or a bad idea because I don't know this problem space well enough but I think it's something to consider if we are not aiming for uh, like um, customer premise equipment, but for enterprise grade hardware, or something like this, then the question is, can it be solved there in other ways already? 
Michael Richardson, um, I'm sorry that the working group last call was so silent and there's issues. Uh, um, uh, probably the, the people that we need, the enterprise reviewers that we need are just not in this working group. I'm writing an email to some people that I think may care. Um, I don't actually think the VLAN thing is terribly useful for organizations that are running many campuses and many places. Um, they're in Canada today. Uh, you may know that there are significant issues getting VLANs out to places and multicast traffic is significantly unwanted. It's probably, yes, they probably have VLANs. Yes, they've probably filtered multicast out. That's exactly what they don't want on their satellite links to Northwest Territories. Right. Okay. So this would be quite attractive for a number of, of things where I think uh, uh, service discovery is simply not happening, period. And so it may be a decade, another decade before, you know, enterprises adopted enough such that everyone says, oh, we actually can do service to discovery in these distributed enterprises. Well, that's what we were chartered to, to facilitate. So, um, uh, yeah, so let, let, let's try to, to, to socialize the document a little bit more, you know, outside of the, I'm going to say the home net issue, um, you know, provenance of some of this working group and back to that space and uh, perhaps we can get some, some. Which working groups would you suggest? Well, that's, a good, that's an interesting question, right? So um, EMU might be very, a, a good place to reach some people because it's the same problem of, you know, with 1X going over EAP to do authentic, authenticated join of the network. Well, okay, now that you've joined, you know, uh, what would you like? Uh, and that that whole model is the same model, right? That you 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 kick back. And we don't we don't punt uh, EAP messages back to the controller with a VLAN, right? We do it over Radius. Same 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 architectural thing. So that that may space and maybe just we don't as a group have those right enterprise people, but we do have some people. That just you know we always have this problem in the ITF. We don't really have enough enterprise representation, um, and. Enterprise operators are, of course, you know, unicorns, right? So. so, Ted, are you willing to send some additional emails out to additional working groups to tell them about this work? Or Well, uh, I think, so what I would suggest as a way forward is um, get to the point where I think that everything that I need to do to the document is done, which may be a very short step. I, I, I haven't actually reviewed it in a while. Just, you know, due diligence. And then... Um, once that's done, then yeah, uh, try to get, I, I know that there are some folks from various places that would probably say yes to this, but we need to actually, um, get them, get them roped in. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll, but we should, we should probably start a last call and, and then I should do the roping in because otherwise they're going to come and comment and they won't be commenting on the last call. And then later on when we do the last call, cause this did get actually quite a bit of comment at one time, but so this, I mean, the, and speaking per, per as chair and procedurally, um, it didn't feel like there was a whole lot of comments. I'll go back and look at the list. Um, but if you get people to comment and say that they're interested in this work, it doesn't have to be in last call. We can consider those as last call or as statements of interest. Uh, interest doesn't need to happen during last call. Okay. Um, yeah, but, I mean, uh, Jan Commissar did, did send us a review about uh, six or eight months ago. Right, we'll, we'll take another look. So maybe once you have done your next round of changes, reach out to all those folks and mm -hmm. reach out to us. And yeah, we can start another last call. That's fine. But okay. if, if you get people even outside of last call to send those statements like of interest to the list, those will be very valuable. Okay. I think it'll be fine to start another WGLC. All right. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll update the document and then send a request. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Stuart. Stuart. Yeah, and I'm uh, just going to uh, echo the request for the people here. It would be helpful to review it. I just had a look. It's only 29 pages, so probably uh, no more than an hour of reading. And if people have contacts uh, at enterprise equipment vendors who are not involved with this working group, which is understandable that for a lot of them, uh, they wouldn't think they have an interest here. If you can send us those contacts, we can reach out to them individually. Thank you.
Tom Pusateri, uh, the reason I brought up VLANs was because I know from experience that people or operators have taken a long time to troubleshoot, to learn how to troubleshoot boot P relays. And this is another thing they have to learn how to troubleshoot. And so it's not the same as troubleshooting a boot P relay. It's a different thing. It's a different problem. Uh, but VLANs is something they do already know how to troubleshoot. And um, there's two other ways I can also think of solving this, and that's IGMP proxies. And Sorry? Like IGMP proxy over a tunnel, uh, over a regular tunnel, and uh, AMT, automatic multicast tunneling. Uh, and but these are link local multicasts. AMT, there's a there's a RFC on it, <clears throat> uh, which is a, a way to join a multicast group over a unicast link to um, and, and join multicast uh, islands together. And and that will work for for link local multicast. Yes. Hmm. So, uh, but anyway, that doesn't solve the problem that um, Michael brought up about. Um, sending multicast more be more multicast than you want you would have to filter if there was multicast you want didn't want yeah i mean it's all just packets when it's going over the transit link anyway but but um the problem is uh you know you you want to make sure that you're not sending anything more than you need to and also i mean honestly setting up a tcp connection to some device over there seems like it's a lighter weight problem than configuring a special tunnel and setting all of the filtering correctly and getting, you know, so, so, you know, it may be that the right answer to this is that we just have a document that says how you set up the tunnel and get the filtering right, but then you have a point solution that only works on certain kinds of devices. So, like, the device has to support IGMP tunneling. Right. So, so the, the point is that there's multiple ways to solve this problem, and you pro your document should probably compare them. Sure. To yeah, your I think that's good. Uh, okay, so by the way, I just wanted to point out in case there's confusion, remember that discovery relay and discovery proxy are two different things. Discovery proxy is the smart thing that uh, uh, actually like does multicast resolution on the local wire, and discovery relay is the dumb thing that just relays the packets and lets the lets the aggregation and resolution stuff happen on a smart server in your in your machine room or wherever. So, um, all right, so moving right along. Um, so the other document that I've been working on uh, is the service registration protocol document. Um, and uh, Tom very kindly did a review of the SRP document uh, a couple months ago at this point. Um, and I was right in the middle of hacking on something and there were deadlines and life got away from me. And so I ha didn't actually look at it for a while after that. But um, I've uh, done some updates and there are some questions that I think it would be worth discussing. So some of the updates are really stupid things like the document was referring to services.arpa and it seemed like the uh, when we were doing the implementation, I, I actually I, I had forgotten that it was services.arpa and so I typed service.arpa and it just seemed to make more sense. And so the document actually now says service.arpa instead of services.arpa because um, it's one less letter and I don't see any real reason why it needs to be services.arpa, but you know, if anybody objects to that, please let me know. Um, and then uh, the document now adds support for TLS. So if you want to do SRP updates over TLS, you can. Uh, and there's a, a, a registration for uh, uh, DNS SRP TLS dot TCP dot, um, you know, DNS name. So for SRV, SRV records. So, um, so that's already been added to the document. There are further updates needed to the document. Um, so I'm gonna just go over Tom's comments a bit. Tom, uh, so the document was written by me as I was doing the implementation. And so of course I had a lot of state in my head and it all made sense to me. Tom read the document and he's like, whoa, this doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and he had a really good point, which is that uh, I use the term update. Um, well, Stuart and I, I think Stuart and I both, both worked on uh, choosing the terminology for this section, and neither one of us really noticed that the update language was a little bit confusing. Um, so, uh, so I'm thinking that we need to change the name of the things that we're calling updates. Right now we have two things that are called updates, the actual SRP update message, which is the collection of all of the things that are to be updated, and also the uh, individual DNS update um, RRs, um, 
And so uh, what I'm proposing is that we either uh, make sure that we always say SRP update when we mean the whole message, and we always say RR update when we mean the RR update, or uh, we just call it an RR add instead of an RR update. Um, I don't really have a strong feeling about that. Um, sometimes uh, the problem with calling it an ad is that it's not always an ad. Sometimes there's already an RR there, and so it's really an update. But uh, I think that's relatively harmless. Thoughts? Uh, a word that comes to mind is register because this is a registration protocol, and yet there's nothing in there that, that is a register. Uh, so we could call the, the whole message an SRP registration instead of an SRP update. I like that. All right. Uh, hopefully that will show up in the minutes. Otherwise, I'll probably forget. But um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that was a hint. <laughs> OK. Um, and Tom also found the discussion of, of, of the, the whole validation section a bit confusing. Um, I don't really have any questions about what to do there. I just didn't have time to do it before the, before the cutoff. So I will do that uh, when I next rev the draft, which will be soon. Um, Tom asked some, some really good security questions. This is the first one. Uh, sh the, the question was, you know, why are we not sending this? Why are we sending this in the clear? Why are we just making a TCP connection? And I hadn't even thought about it. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. And uh, as I said, I added TLS support to the document. Um, my next question is, should we require TLS support? Should we not even offer the option of doing it over plain TCP? Um, anybody have an opinion about that? Tim Martin back, yes. Do you have an opinion about it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I think if it goes off the land, it should be required. All right. But if you're going to do, uh, you know, something on the land like with UDP, I don't think we have a way to 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 do that test. Well, and and you know, if we care about keeping the information, I mean, the thing is, this is a this is a record that we're publishing, which will then be able to be looked up. So it's not like it's really a big huge secret. Um, so there is an argument to be made for it's really not that important, but Tim? Relaying for Keith Moore, yes, require TCP always, even on LAN. No, no, I think he means, TCP or TLS? I think he means TLS. Oh, okay. But, yeah. yeah. Okay, TLS. all right. All right, well, I'd say, you know, from the perspective of voting, <laughs> we've got a clear vote. Um, but who's going to sign the certificates so if it's allowed? Uh, well, this would be opportunistic security, so so it doesn't need to be signed certificates. We are we're already requiring it for DNS push, and the current implementation that I have for DNS push, <laughs> the current implementation that I have for DNS push does not check the cert. It just, just takes advantage of the of the you know if if you have an on path attacker, the on path attacker will be able to intercept your connection and and violate your privacy. But but at least it makes it more expensive to do that. And you could do TOEFL security like trust on first use or. Yeah, we'd have to describe how to do that. Um, I think that that it, it might make sense to describe how to do it with certificates, but uh, if we did that, I'd kind of like to do it using Dane, and um, and I'm not really ready to write that text, so that's why uh, that's why I'm punting. Uh, but if somebody wants to offer text, you know, we can talk. Uh, so Tom brought up another security issue, which I think was a really good one um, that I hadn't thought about, which is that we currently are just asking for a global Anycast address. Um, so if you send a message, so, oh, sorry, a little backstory. There's two different ways that SRP works. One of them is um, that uh, we require TCP for, for fully featured SRP clients. So the client is required to connect with TCP, and then we get a three-way handshake, and that means we know that we're actually talking to who we think we're talking to, and they're roughly where they, where they claim to be. Um, however, for uh, IoT devices, um, requiring the full discovery process is kind of painful, and so I came up with a way to, on IoT networks only, support uh, this global Anycast address update. Um, and the idea there is basically the client just doesn't the client doesn't do any service discovery at all. It just sends out an update and it says, hi, I'm offering this service. Here's the information. Good luck. 
And by the way, it, it uses a domain of service. It sent, it's DNS updates her to, 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 to the service.arpa domain. That's, that's where that comes in. Um, so, uh, and that's like really lightweight. And I'll tell you a little bit more about just how lightweight it is because it's kind of awesome. Um, but uh, the point of that is that is that I just allocated a global address. And so now this, this IoT device is sending this update message. And if there isn't something sitting on path intercepting the message to the Anycast address, it's going to go out to the internet, right? It's just, gonna, it's just going to get routed somewhere onto the backbone and then eventually get dropped. Um, but possibly not before some malefactor sniffs it and figures out that you have light switches in your house or something. Um, and, you know, we'd like to avoid that. We don't want some malefactor to be able to sniff your, your traffic and know that there are light switches in your house. And you just told us it's going to be TLS over TCP in the previous slide. Okay. So, so two, two different scenarios here. One is the all singing, all dancing SRP right. update scenario. The other is the, the, uh, the constrained device update scenario. So I'm talking now about the second, the constrained device update scenario. And the constrained device update scenario, we're not doing TCP and we're not doing TLS, at least in principle. Um, maybe that's the wrong thing to do. I think that you should, we, you know, we, we uh, you and I had some IMs yesterday or something about this document and uh, uh, the uh, core resource discovery mm -hmm. process. Yeah. Um, and I don't think this is a useful feature based on what I now know and our discussion back and forth. Um, I think that, that... When you say you don't think this is a useful feature, you mean... Think, I don't think that this is something that a, a, a device, a, an IoT device which is sufficiently constrained that it can't do TCP and TLS should be doing on its own. So... So we have categories, I mean, that's 72, 28, you know, uh, aside because it doesn't actually give us, you know, classes to describe the devices that are above it. Mm -hmm. But essentially, if you can, if you have enough energy to run Wi-Fi, then you have enough energy to run TCP. But off we're not, the, the, okay. the use case for this is not that you have enough energy to run Wi-Fi. Right. So what I'm trying to say is if you are that class of device, then I think you can fall into category A. Okay? Which is? Which is use TCP and TLS and and the normal discovery that we do. Sure. Okay. If you are not at that level, uh -huh. then there is probably, there, there has to be some kind of a gateway just to get your data from, right. you know, the yeah. internet that we all love to the network that you're doing. Yes. That device can do resource discovery um, from you in a energy efficient way and can do service discovery proxy to the rest well, of the so, so there isn't a way to do that. Okay. So what I'm saying is that gateway can be the thing that is so translating between. What, what I would, what this, the, the purpose of this is to do service registration protocol from the edge device. I understand that. It is not to do okay. service, it is not to do some kind of mapping between core RD and service registration protocol. Maybe I don't understand the space of things because I uh, well enough, and I, I, but but my feeling is that that I think that the problem that you've created with the AnyCast, and I remember we had the whole AnyCast discussion. I think it wandered into six man and all this kind of stuff. Yep. And I'm and and I'm actually quite upset that we don't have a good answer to the problem that you just have said. Mm. Um, I think the answer is we need a a ULA central address. Uh, uh, right. allocated so, so that it gets dropped correctly. Okay. See the slide. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So I understand yeah. that. So I think that's the right answer yeah. to the problem. But before we do that, I'm not actually sure this is a problem we should solve is what I'm trying to say, or that so, this working group should solve without more thinking and, and back and forth. Stuart, do you want to step up to the mic? Uh, yeah, this is something where I can give some more background. Uh, as, as many of you know, Apple has some home automation work with the HomeKit products. Um, and right now they use Wi-Fi, which is good for AC connected products and not so good for battery powered products. I, and that this right now is a pet project of mine, uh, I have been interested in looking at 
ways that we could make home kit more battery friendly. And uh, that's why I've been attending the Thread uh, group meetings. For those who don't know, Thread is something that came out of Google Nest. It's uh, a mesh network led on top of six low pad, which runs over IEEE 802.15.4, which are quarter megabit uh, wireless technology, similar speed and range and battery consumption to Bluetooth, but has the benefit of being more IP friendly, which is why I'm predisposed to like that. Uh, and then I've been going through this little thought process of if we wanted to run HomeKit on Thread, what would we need? We don't necessarily need a gateway to the greater internet. I could imagine a, a, just a self-contained thread mesh that doesn't even connect to my home Wi-Fi, but it allows light switches to control lights via IP packets on that mesh. In order for that to be done with the HomeKit protocols, the light switches have to discover the lights that they're turning on and off. And HomeKit doesn't use Core RD. HomeKit uses DNS service discovery. So this leads us to the question, if we were to build HomeKit devices that are battery powered running on 82.15.4, how would we provide the facilities that they need? And that leads us to this work, which is how would you do DNS service discovery without resorting to just flooding multicast everywhere and running the batteries down? Right. So that's a motivation for, for doing this work. Um, and essentially, what we're offering here is just here's a lightweight way to do this thing on uh, on an 802.15.4 network or something like that. Um, and you know, it's it's not a huge change to the whole protocol. In fact, it's it's essentially the exact same thing, except that you're not going out and looking up the SRV record. You're just sending it to some well-known address. Um, so you know, one option is certainly to say no, you can't do that. Um, that would be kind of a weird thing to say, um, but certainly the working group could say that. Um, another thing to say is, sure, go ahead and do that, but you need to use a site scoped any any cast address, in which case we have to go out and solve that problem, which is kind of heavyweight. Um, or we can just make it something where it's not specified um, how the what what address is used, but just generally speaking, if you want to use this this lightweight mode, uh, then whatever uh, IoT or constrained network you're using it on is going to need to have a well-defined address to which these packets are sent. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know what to say about the whole core RD versus uh, the NSSD thing. That's really not, it's, I'm just not even interested in core RD. So um, maybe I would be at some point in the future, but I'm not right now. So, so I'm just interested in solving this particular problem. And the question is whether there's, you know, whether it's something we should in fact solve. Uh, personally, I think it is, I think it's useful. Um, I mean, whether you think core RD is a good idea or not, I think it is useful to be able to announce the presence of a device and register it as a service in DNSSD. So Michael Richards again. Um, I am not as terribly clued into the, what Thread is doing, and they're very, it's very hard to know if, without going to the meetings and paying the large amounts of money. If you'd like to bring me, I'm very happy to go there. <laughs> um, Noted. Uh, uh, but um, I, I am working with Thread on enrollment things, and um, they do a lot of things differently just for the hell of doing it differently. So if, if I were to learn that they actually have a service discovery protocol you know, already, I would, I'm almost certain of that is the fact. So if you were to make HomeKit work under thread, you would either have to convince them to run this or do something else. Okay, so I think it's not entirely a, a particularly important um, consideration. The point is that whatever, I don't think it matters whether they're running SRP or they're running something else or core RD. The point I'm trying to say is that if there's going to be, if, if it's going to matter to devices outside of that network, then there's a gateway that is mediating yeah. that process. Okay. Yep. So I think that we could have that 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 happen. And I think that's a I think that would be a better, I think that would be better. Having said that, I'm not opposed to you going forward. Okay. Okay. I think that if you don't want to go through the rigmarole of trying to find us a site scoped address any cast that's going to leak 
uh, sorry, that's going to secure, uh, be secure when it leaks, right? Um, then I think you should defer the work until we do that. Okay. Yeah. This part of it. Yeah. Having said that, I think we should do get the site scope any past thing worked out, but uh, it's as you say, it's going to be a at least an hour and a half conversation in three different six man meetings before we can have this happen. Right. right? Yeah. So, so, but maybe that's worthwhile. Yeah. So basically, the 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 status quo now is that we're currently using a global address, and t uh, Tom pointed out that that's a bad idea and I agree with him. And so I think that the the uh, expedient fallback and the one that probably makes the most sense is to just consider the use case that we actually have in mind and and think about what would work there. And the answer is a mesh local ULA, a well-known address within the mesh local ULA. Stuart? Uh, yeah, Michael, you asked some interesting questions. Um, so I'll briefly answer them uh, because we had similar questions. Uh, when I started getting involved with this. You might assume that the thread group has a discovery protocol defined. They actually don't at all. Uh, the way thread discovery, in quotes, works today with the Nest thermostats and the smoke detectors is that everything phones home to the cloud. And the, quote, discovery is the which devices are owned by the same Nest account in the cloud. There is no local peer-to-peer -peer discovery. It's all mediated through the cloud. So that was a disappointment because we were hoping to find something a little bit more fully baked. Uh, with Apple's different priorities, the home kit uh, is built without a cloud service. It assumes you've got some brains in the house and nothing has to leave the house. So, so things need to discover them, other peers on the network. So that is how we went down this path, which is, Thread has no discovery mechanism currently defined. They need to define one to grow beyond their current limited use cases. And uh, naturally, this is what we're advocating. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's how we're... Now, the feedback about the details here is incredibly valuable. I agree that any address that might escape the house by accident uh, definitely is not what we want to risk for privacy reasons. So maybe for the thread case, the answer is that the thread local network data conveys a configured address to the clients and they use that. So for the thread case, I think we can solve this. For broader use cases, this might still be an interesting discussion to figure out how to automate it for all link types. Uh, Kirsten Amses, uh, I think that we have the, the, the RD and the, the, DN, and the DNSSD discoveries um, have their, their dissimilarities, but when it comes to the Anycast address and having an, an ARPA domain for all those site local things, um, I think we should sit down together and kind of compare notes on, on what we can unify and where we, where we have separate ecosystems. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it's a separate conversation, but yeah, that's definitely worth doing. Um, all right, so moving right along, um, I think that the conclusion that I'm drawing from this is that I should just say that we should use a mesh local address and that this document, that's out of scope for this document, but but generally speaking, this is what we suggest. Um, so uh, Tom also pointed out something, and Stuart, I haven't actually had a chance to talk with you about this, so I apologize for springing it on you on a slide, but here it is anyway. Um, Tom pointed out that, that sleep proxy is not entirely compatible with what we're doing for SRP because SRP doesn't necessarily assume that the thing we're updating is on the local wire. Um, and he was confused by that. And I think it may mean that, that we basically, so, so SRP is a router unicast protocol. The DNS server does not have to be on the local wire. Sleep proxy requires a presence on link. Um, uh, sleep proxy is essentially doing the same thing as SRP, and that's why SRP and Sleep Proxy are in the same document, but it's not doing entirely the same thing because we have to support the wake on land feature. Um, so we need to figure out whether the right thing to do is have a Sleep Proxy document or to uh, make things sufficiently clear that it doesn't uh, trigger Tom. Um, and uh, which, uh, by I mean, with all due respect, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have been triggered. You should have, but but we need to make sure that it's clear enough that when you read it, you're like, oh, okay, not what the. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, does anybody have opinions on which right, which path we should take on this?
Michael Richardson again. Um, I would say uh, if if uh, if it enhances this document and makes it more applicable and makes it easier for developers, then you should probably keep it in the document. The ISG seems to want us to have fewer documents. Um, so if the motivation for sleep proxy, if the sleep proxy has an existence or motivation which could be deployed without this document, I don't think that's true. But if that was the case, then I would say, okay, maybe it makes sense a separate document. Yep. Um, if for some reason the document was monstrously too big and you have had the comment about two big documents are impossible to review in, in advance, then I would say it's something to remove, but I don't think that's the case. Yeah, I don't think it so, is. Um, so I think it's, it's maybe it doesn't really gel with the rest of the concept, but you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, I think it, it fits into the, the space. Yeah. I, the, the thing that we really want uh, to add, so sleep proxy already exists. Like if you have any Apple products, they already have sleep proxy built into them. Um, but what we wanted to add to that was first come first serve naming. And so really, if you, you could think of this as just three separate use cases for the general uh, SRP registration update. One of them is registering to an SRP server that's, uh, that's serving uh, possibly a, a multi-subnet LAN. One of them is regist registering your IoT device that's on a constrained network. And the third is uh, registering with a sleep proxy. And a sleep proxy is not an SRP server in the same sense. So, so essentially, I think maybe that's a way to explain this that, that is less confusing. Does that make sense to you, Tom? Okay. So, so in other words, uh, SRP updates are the same for all use cases. However, SRP uh, updates to, there, there are three different things you might send an SRP, sorry, an SRP registration to, changing the terminology. Uh, you might send an SRP registration to uh, a, a DNS server, an authoritative DNS server to have it add that to its database. You might send it to uh, your, uh, your what are we calling these things? Your border router, your, your, your constrained network border router. Um, or you might send it to your sleep proxy, three different recipients of the same type of message that has the same essential features. Um, and the way that they're handled are slightly different, but they basically all have more in common than, than, they're, than is different about them. Tim, did you want to? Yeah, Tim, welcome back. Um, I, I agree with what has been said before. So I think it would be better to have this stuff in one document, but like clearly separated in, in, in their differences. <laughs> Uh, because, yeah, too many documents don't make 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 it better after all. Right. Yeah, we we did go down that path for a while in the ITF, and it was exciting. Um, so, uh, if if uh, if the note taker could could uh, explicitly note that we're going to have these three different uh, use cases for the for the awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Much appreciated. All right. So. Uh, now, now that we're done with the boring stuff, um, uh, so uh, I've, I've done an implementation of the SRP client uh, that, that actually I have running on a thread board as it happens. Um, and uh, it's pretty sweet. It's, uh, the whole, the whole uh, the, all the code is less than 10K, including key generation and six, six zero signing. Um, it's really simple. It just adds one service, uh, and the message that it sends to the server is about 320 bytes. So it's 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 very compact and, and efficient for what it does, I think, um, and uh, does seem to work. Um, Tim, I, I might add a little to Buttonberg. So I think I wrote something like this on last year's hackathon here in Montreal as well. Yeah, you did so a. I I might dig it out and uh, post it somewhere where. It, People can see it, but it was also pretty pretty simple one service, and then but it used the prompt call. Now, did, did yours do the six zero part? I'm not sure. I I have to look back into it. Maybe it the it didn't. Yeah, when I looked at the code that you had, it didn't have six zero. But I don't know if I was looking at the at the final version. Yeah, yeah. So. I'll dig it out again and send okay. it to the list. All right. Yeah. If you need uh, any help with the six zero stuff, let me know. Um, okay, so uh, so that's the client side. Um, I've also implemented an SRP proxy, yet another proxy, right? So um, I wanted to be able to have uh, to receive actual SRP 
registrations on port 53 and have them update an authoritative DNS server. But I looked at doing that to buy nine and it was actually a fairly big job. I think it's doable and, and I'm talking to Mark Andrews about that, but I wanted something that was, that was not, basically I wanted something generic that could be put in front of any authoritative server that accepts, accepts DNS updates. And so um, I wrote some code that does that. And uh, so what the code does is it receives the, the SRP registration um, and uh, then it figures out what DNS updates it has to do. Now, the idea with an SRP registration is that the whole thing fits into one message because it's all of the all of the records are pointing at each other and there are no prerequisites. DNS update allows you to use prerequisites to prevent data from being added to the zone that you don't want to add to the zone. And, you know, and it, and it allows you to do a sort of, uh, it, it allows you to do an atomic update of the database where, you know, if these prerequisites are, prerequisites are true, then do the update and don't, change the database in between checking the prerequisites and doing the update. Um, SRP doesn't, there's no way to do a single message SRP update with prerequisites because there are too many different things and, and uh, DNS update prerequisites don't allow you to do things like if then else. So um, so what I've done instead for the, so the proxy is receiving a single message and then first it just tries to do the update straight and sets the prerequisites. If nothing's there, do the update. Um, and if that succeeds, great, we just did it. Uh, if that fails, uh, or actually, first it does no change. So it, it, the, the, the assumption is that the record is already there. We're gonna send an update and uh, the prerequisites are that the record is there and contains the same information as before. Um, and that can, that can happen in one message. Um, if there's nothing there, then that can happen in one message, but that would be a second message. And then the third thing that happens is neither one of those attempts worked. And that means that there's something there, but it's not the same as what's in the SRP registration. So now we have to actually go through and iterate. And so it, it's, it's this complicated state machine that just goes through and does all the iterations, adds or, or, or updates various records. And if it comes to a, case, to a situation where it realizes that there's something in the zone that conflicts with the SRP registration, then it has to back everything out and send a failure response. And on the other hand, if it gets all the way to the end and doesn't have any problem, then that was success and it sends a success result. Um, I've tested, I think I've exhaustedly tested all of the various different ways that it can succeed or fail and they all seem to work. So it's pretty sweet. It's actually kind of fun to watch because you see like one SRP update come in and then like a bunch of events occur in the log. Um, that was fun. Future work, um, home net integration. Uh, we need to, we were talking about this on the HomeNet mailing list actually. Uh, HNCP identifies links. Um, it would be nice if uh, the uh, DNSSD discovery proxy, that was three implementations ago, if the discovery proxy could um, take advantage of the information that HNCP is sharing. Uh, packages for OpenWRT, we already have them, but there's still some uh, some work to be done so that you can just install them and it just works without you having to fiddle around with it, which currently there's a readme file that has a fair number of instructions in it. Um, so uh, that's one bit of future work that we wanna do. Another bit of future work is a fully featured SRP client, similar to what Tim did, except possibly we don't know whether he did SIG0 or not. Um, so that would be really cool. Um, and it sounds like it's gonna have to support TLS also. Um, and I don't think that's a big amount of work, but it needs to happen. Um, it'd be nice to have SRP support in some DNS auth server. And I'm thinking bind nine, Mark Andrews, as I said, has, has, uh, talked to me about some work that he's been doing to make bind nine support a wider variety of different kinds of update strategies. And it would be kind of cool to add this in as another update strategy. Um, Mark has indicated a willingness to, to collaborate with me to some extent on this, although presumably I have to do most of the work. Um, so I'm hoping that this will happen before Singapore, but I make no promises. Um, SRP Relay, uh, if we wind up having a link local Anycast address for the simple, the, the IoT style SRP update, it'd be awfully nice to have a relay that sits on the border router that's pretty stupid and just relays it to the actual SRP server rather than having to have an SRP server on the border router. So that's, uh, that's my list of future work. Um, I'm not 
promising that any of these things will be done at any particular time, but uh, they are definitely on the agenda. And if anybody's interested in hacking on any of this stuff, please let me know. Uh, and also, uh, if you're interested in just like playing around with the stuff that I've already got, please let me know. There will be some information on uh, the next slide about that. SRP, the future of SRP. So SRP uh, got one review during last call. Thank you, Tom. Um, and the chairs were really mean and decided that that wasn't enough. And so, <laughs> complain, complain. So it turned out that what we talked about this in the home net meeting on Tuesday and everybody there seemed to think this was useful. And so it seems like we really could have gotten enough comments to make this work look like it was like it had support, but we didn't because we didn't actually ask home net to comment on it. So we're gonna do that hopefully in another last call. Um, so uh, and so hopefully that'll mean that we don't drop this and it be, gets published as an RFC. Um, so my proposal is I'm gonna update the document, um, add in the stuff that we've talked about, we'll do another review um, and uh, try to include home net and maybe DNS op, uh, although that could be dangerous. Um, and hopefully that will result in us being able to publish this. So that's all I got. Tom? Thank you, Tom Pusateri. Um, so there's one comment I made that you didn't address that um, I think it should be addressed in the document. And okay. that's it. How do you delete a registration before the lease lifetime expires? And you may not want to do that, but there's ah, currently yes. a way to do that. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. I, I spaced out on that, and that's a really good point. So in other words, we want, in addition to an SRP registration, we want an SRP deregistration. Yeah? Or maybe maybe you don't. Maybe. I Well, so, so DNSSD over MDNS currently does do that, right? If you have a device that, that is sending out an advertise or has, has sent out an advertisement, to somebody that, that it's on the network. When it when you shut it down, if it's able to send out a, a goodbye packet, it does. And I think this is the equivalent of that goodbye packet. And I, I agree that that's worth doing. Yeah, you know, it's just an omission. So thank you for pointing that out. And then the other thing is, if there's anything that you learned um, extending update, it would be interesting, I think, to incorporate these into a new version of update that other applications can benefit from. <laughs> And then maybe one day this can migrate to update to the new version of update. Yeah, I mean, if we were if we had it all to do over again, <laughs> I mean, I actually when I first started working on this, I was thinking, do we really want to do this in a DNS packet? I wound up doing it in a DNS packet because it's just expedient; it's less work. There's already stuff out there that that accepts DNS updates, and so I was able to test it very easily, and it's it's all very straightforward. If we really wanted to do DNS updates right, we would probably just have, you know, a dough thing that does DNS updates and, and has like a more uh, like a post hmm? like a post yeah well yeah, yeah I mean sure but but yeah. but mainly that, that has like a more rich uh, uh, prerequisites language so that we can do a single uh, update you know an atomic update to the database that adds everything at once and checks all the prerequisites at once and so we don't have the situation where I have to go in add things back out you know the worst case scenario is I add things then I back out but something else stumbled over something that I added in the process and it backed out and now everybody's unhappy we really want it to be atomic but there isn't a way to do that unless it's unless it's happening on the server the first come first serve stuff comes to mind is something that um, regular update could benefit from as well yeah Yep, for sure. Yeah, and actually, I think uh, Mark would be down with with adding that to bind nine. Um, so, anyway, uh, any other questions? Should we move on to fate of the working group? <laughs> Thanks, Ted. All right, so our uh, last agenda item, which can cover all the time we have left, which is until 3.30, so 40 minutes, um, is about the future of the working group. So, Tom, what? Sorry, Michael's typing stuff that I already have in the notes below where he's typing. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, Tom brought this up on the list, so the, thanks, Tom, that um, we don't, have that much um, feedback on some of our latest documents. 
And we were wondering, so kind of where do we go from here? We were considering for a while uh, rechartering this working group. And one of the main topics that we were considering for the new charter was the privacy work. Um, that said, so that, that is still a possible viable path forward, but similarly, there's not a, it doesn't feel like there's a huge amount of energy going into the privacy work. And so one option, which I'm not saying I'm recommending any of these, but one that has been suggested is to move that work somewhere else and close this working group. So I wanted to hear feedback from anyone in the working group of what are your thoughts on this question? What should we be doing? I'm looking for feedback from all of our authors, but also from everyone else in the community. Stuart Church again. I, I want to echo what David is saying. From a personal standpoint, I think privacy is really important. And I think in the last year, there's been a lot more awareness of how important privacy is. And I think that's only going to continue. I, I've i thought about these questions of how to do discovery in a privacy preserving way a lot, and I don't know the answers. So uh, I think it's important, but I don't know how to do it. If there are other people in the working group with good ideas and there's energy for doing this, I would love to support that. Um, I, I think it would be sad if we wrap up the working group just as the whole world suddenly wakes up to the importance of privacy, that would be unfortunate timing. So uh, I hope we can find a way to move forward. Uh, unfortunately, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and I have not worked out any wonderful answer that just solves all the problems and is also efficient and reliable at the same time. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Ted Lemon. So I uh, actually I attended a, a side meeting yesterday, um, the MedUp side meeting. Um, this is a group that's been meeting, sort of associated with the IATF, but hasn't really pushed to actually form a working group here. And they are interested in this topic. Um, uh, it might be good to to try to get some of the people that are that are that show up for those meetings. Um, circled in on this whole DNS discovery privacy thing. Can I ask you to elaborate on what that group is about? So um, they're met up, uh, what do they call it? Uh, distributed uh, something privacy. <laughs> Sorry. Deeper. No. Hmm? Deeper? No, no, not deeper. Uh, yeah, no, distributor. So basically, it's ad hoc privacy. So basically, the same problem that we're talking about. There, yeah, that there's, sounds related. Hmm? Yeah, it does it sound related. really does sound related. Um, they're working, the, the work that was presented there this time was all about um, coming up with uh, uh, ad, basically doing doing ad hoc keying. So, so some work that... Uh, that Daniel Kahn Gilmore has been has been doing with a bunch of other people on um, coming up with ways to do s encrypted email that doesn't suck that has a good user experience, um, which means it's less secure, but but it, it's still it's better than nothing, right? So uh, so that's interesting and kind of not what we're talking about. Um, there was another group that was doing something similar with instant messaging. Um, I think that the work that we're doing isn't exactly the same as the work that they're doing, but it's synergetic with it. Like they could take advantage of what we're trying to do and they would probably be interested in what we're trying to do. And they probably know something about the problem space and might be interested in working on the problems that we're working on too. So that's why I say that they would be good people to talk to. I think that even though they haven't actually gone down the path that we've gone down, I think if we said, hey, what do you think about this? They'd all be like, ooh, that sounds good. So. Thanks. Christian Wittemann. Well, I've been work, trying for some years to get uh, privacy work to actually start into this working group. And I've come to the conclusion that it's not going to happen because, I mean, we have been going through various things. Now, uh, I think that we did some, a number of things that should be somehow published. And I think I will need to find a way in particular to publish the privacy requirement documents that we have. 
because they, they are this the analysis there that could inspire other solutions. But as for uh, the studying of solution, I think that they would have to come organically from the other groups that are doing any kind of discovery. Thanks, Christian. Um, and uh, that makes sense to me. Um, if we were to try to move the uh, privacy requirements document to publication, could we? Could I have a show of hands on who would be willing to read that document and comment on it? Thanks. Okay, so I think we can try uh, that. Um, you're one of the authors, right, Christian, on that one? Yeah, I mean, given the general level of energy on the project, I mean, that thing expired, but I mean, I could easily uh, yeah. run a new version to uh, say, reiterate the draft. Yeah, no, like, yeah, if you want to revive it and then email the list for comments, I think moving it forward and publishing all of the, because that's true, a lot of thought and work has gone in this working group on developing these requirements. I think public regardless of whether we come up with a solution or not, I think publishing the requirements is a reasonable thing. So, thanks. So I'm Michael McCool from Intel, um, and I'm also co-chair of the Web of Things Working Group in W3C. And my interest in this is we are trying to distribute information about devices, but we want to do it in a privacy-preserving way. In fact, it's one of our requirements to get to our recommendation status in W3C. But uh, we fundamentally need a discovery service to control distribution of metadata, and uh, especially in the home context and also the smart city context. And so this is kind of a fundamental requirement for what we want to accomplish, and we feel for ecosystem adoption. So the real question is, where does that work belong, right? Uh, so is it, is it, should it be an extension of DNS? Um, there's also work over in core on the core resource directory, right? And so, in my opinion, there's really two problems. One is the service provides the metadata, and there's the question of how you find that service, right? Um, and in some cases, I see these things, these functionalities merged together, and I really think there should be a, a, a two separate phase with authentication in between, because really what you do is get authenticated information to data. And so I, I noticed earlier someone is saying, well, if it's published, then everyone knows about it, it's not secret anymore, but actually, even like a, an address that has a name, like temperature sensor dot, dot, dot local, is a leak of information about you know, what's available. So I think it's extremely important, but I think uh, you know, we need to think very hard about where it belongs. Maybe it shouldn't be in this group because maybe it shouldn't be DNS-based. Maybe it should be a new thing. Maybe DNS should only be the springboard for the you know, initial introduction to a, to a controlled service. So I think, uh, I think maybe we need to think of this at a higher level and think really hard about where it belongs and what, what, how, how a group should be chartered to do a, a privacy-preserving discovery service. That's definitely a possibility. Thank you. Tim Wattenberg. So I think this working group does valuable work and we're not finished with this. So closing it down right now would just doesn't make sense in my, my view. Um, I think there's, we have a problem with the lack of participation, at least on the discussion on the mailing list. I mean, today I think we got, got a good discussion here um, on the things we, we brought, brought up uh, on the agenda. But that's, yeah, th th that's I guess the problem. And the question is how can we get more people, maybe also from different angles and uh, doing different stuff to to notice and also comment on the work which is done here. Um, yeah, and I guess after all, so of course not speaking for, for him, but uh, I think Tom didn't actually want the working group to shut down, but just to give a wake up call on that. That's That would be my guess because otherwise, I don't know if he would be sitting here. Uh, <laughs> so I think, yeah, it's it's once again a good call to just see if we can get people interested in what we're doing here. Maybe they don't even know <laughs> that there would be something uh, which would be interesting for them, which they could use. Uh, the question I cannot answer is how to get these people here. And maybe some more experienced ITF community people have a better idea, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Eric Vink here. Uh, with my AD at on. So indeed, the lack of interaction about the privacy is kind of concerning. 
happy to see that five people are happy to, to review it. So that will be a good sign. Now, typically in this kind of document, you will not find the privacy people in this room, but in other rooms. The document can stay here, but making some publicity of this document in other working group, like Brian will do on DeepRive in a couple of minutes, is good. So it's up to you, Chair, as well, to make some publicity outside. So the, we uh, we have tried that in the past uh, ITFs, uh, starting, I think, uh, actually in Montreal a year ago, and didn't get that much um, support from like other people in this community, or sorry, in the ITF community at large, um, to come to this working group. Perhaps one of the reasons is that they care about privacy, but maybe not in this specific context. That then uh, I'm speculating at, at that point. But okay, um, right. it's, it's worth another try. Very true. Agreed. We are in sync. Michael Richardson. So I'll point out that SAG is happening right now. Sorry, say again? The SAG working group, the security area working group is right now. We're in conflict with it. Okay. So, you know, more empty chairs than full. All the people you wanted, most of them are, unless they came here, because they, you know, I probably would have gone there, but I thought this was interesting. I was unaware. I did read. Christian's documents. Um, I, I have a vision of actually thinking about it in my old office, which I haven't been to in two years. So, I mean, it was at least that long ago. I was unaware. I just assumed they'd gone to working group last call and gone out. I was unaware that they were stalled. Okay. Um, so, I would support the comment that, yeah, the, the working group is having difficulties. Um, and uh, but I don't think it's time to give up at this point. Um, and let's get SRP published. Uh, there's only so many cycles for everybody in the whole in the whole thing. Uh, and uh, I don't think I, so we're certainly not done. And I would encourage Christian to uh, to take up the pen again as well. And so um, I think one thing that we were probably supposed to do, probably me, was to take Tom's charter discussions um, that are in the GitHub and start forwarding them around to the group to look into potential rechartering language to explicitly support the secure um, the privacy efforts here. So I need to do that. So uh, Tedleman, a um, couple things. One, uh, just to reflect uh, back again, what Pete, uh, sorry, what Mike said. Um, uh, Michael, anyway, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I have several times missed the TLS working group because it was opposite DNSSD. So again, uh, the likelihood of us actually getting the, the really deeply committed privacy people in this room if we're opposite any SEC area meeting is zero. Um, and so we have to have a hard, if, if, if we're serious about doing this work and if this is the working group to be doing it in, we have to have a hard requirement that we have conflicts with TLS, SAG, uh, Deprive, you know, pretty much any, any working group that's doing anything with, with, that's related to privacy. And I absolutely Quick. agree, and that's what we put into the data tracker. But at the uh -huh. end of the way of the day, I don't think there's any single slotted ITF that doesn't conflict with some security meeting. Yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe that's a good thing in a sense. So, yeah. So anyway, the other thing to point out is that uh, this doesn't have to happen at ITF meetings. Um, so one of the things we can do, and I think uh, I might take this as an action item, is to actually present something about this unless one of the authors wants to at the next Hot RFC um, so that like, there's just a little bit more visibility and people actually join the mailing list and start discussing this with us. Um, as far as the energy to work on the document, again, what Michael was saying is totally applicable to, to my experience as well. Um, I reviewed all of the documents. I sent substantial comments on them. Um, and uh, and then the work just just you know, I, I stopped seeing new versions of the document. So it's not because I'm not interested in the document. And and you know I'm not saying this to blame anybody because I've done the exact same thing, right? Like I've been busy working on implementations of all of this stuff, and I haven't actually updated my documents as frequently as might have been desired. So um, uh, we 
I think that we have a, 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 a lot of, I think we have a lot of expertise in this room that's related to the problem space that we're talking about, and it would be a shame to disband that expertise. expertise. However, I think that the clock rate of this working group is not three times a year. And part of the reason why it appears that there isn't um, energy to work is that we're just not working that fast. It's not that we're not working. It's not that we're not making progress. It's just that we're not making progress on a, on a pulse rate of, of every four months. So um, I, I think that, that that mere fact is not a reason to disband the working group. Thanks. That makes sense. And one of the things we discussed actually is that we don't necessarily have that much to talk about every four months. So one potential option would be that for next, one of the next ITFs, either we don't meet in person or um, we meet jointly with another working group. Um, Which on Tuesday morning, the HomeNet people who did meet actually suggested that it would be really useful if we could maybe just do a joint session with DNSSD and maybe have, you know, have a two hour session like we have here and have 30 minutes for HomeNet or so. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Stuart? Uh, yeah, I like those suggestions. I like what I've been hearing. Uh, I think Eric's right. We, uh, all of us, not just the chairs, need to figure out how to publicize this. I agree with what Ted said, that giving a hot RFC talk is a great opportunity on Sunday night to uh, introduce people. And you said you already listed the security areas as a conflict, which is good. Let's if, if we decide to continue for next time, let's try to stress that more with the ISG because what I see about the work of this working group evolving is we have solved some of the initial challenges of uh, less reliance on multicast and more reliable discovery. And now really the remaining goal we have is this privacy work. So we've almost shifted from being a DNS working group into a security area working group. and people outside this group have no way of knowing that if we don't tell them. True. Thanks. Tom, could I ask you to share your thoughts since you sparked this discussion on the mailing list? Yeah. Um, so I think my email was in response to um, the last call, working group last call of those two documents, which were, you know, the main focus of the work of this working group and having been the only one who reviewed one of them and no one reviewed the other, I was pretty discouraged. Uh, so, uh, and it doesn't, if you think they're good, then it doesn't take a lot of work to say, I think it's good, right? That's all we needed, but we got nothing. And so that made me think, well, you know, who are we doing this for? And then it made me think about, well, initially we had a, a, uh, group of people who came to us and said they had a problem to be solved and we solved it and we those people are gone. Uh, are they deploying this? Do they have any intention to deploy it? Are they asking their vendors to implement it so they can deploy it? And those are the questions that I think we need to answer. And I think they're still unanswered. Thanks and I guess so this from limited experience, I suspect that those are markets that don't maybe evolve as crazy quickly as other working groups. So to Ted's earlier comment, maybe giving them time is what's needed here. Ted Lemon again. Yeah, just one thing to say about the, the adoption rate is that if nobody's using, if, if, if there isn't a, a device that can consume some of the stuff that we've designed here, then there's no point in deploying that functionality on your network. Uh, once there is a device that can consume that, then, then suddenly it becomes more worthwhile. So it'll be interesting to see if there's additional uptake now that we actually have DNS push in uh, iOS and Mac OS next generation. Yeah. And actually, because uh, that's a very good point, uh, that's maybe not obvious to everyone. Could uh, someone from that makes handheld devices uh, comment on what's currently supported and what's been added recently? <laughs> yeah, Ted actually mentioned this on this slide, but I agree it's worth uh, highlighting it. Uh, 
Ted has been working uh, initially as a contractor, and now we're moving to hiring him full time. Ted has been working at Apple, implementing this work in macOS and iOS. And I'm not leaking any secrets there because this is in the public betas. So if you install iOS 13 or macOS Catalina, then you have a fully functioning push notification client and it will connect to the uh, discovery proxy that we have running on OpenWRT. And uh, it's uh, very pleasing for me to be able to turn services on and off and, and see them update live on my iPhone and see that it's all working as it should. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is when we were off designing this protocol and uh, like the discovery proxy that uh, Stuart Musley designed, uh, the router and switch vendors were coming up with alternate solutions by taking listening for broadcasts, uh, I mean, um, multicasts on one network and sending them to another. And uh, they've kind of went ahead and solved the problem in the switches and in the uh, in the uh, routers and stuff in a non-optimal way. But, you know, that's, those solutions are deployed today in on campuses. And so we have to have some sort of compelling reason for them to stop doing that and start doing this. Michael Richardson, a question. Um, will um, and I think this is an implementation ish question. Um, will I discover devices at my home when I'm connected to it over a VPN? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. That is actually a really, you know, kind of killer app. Yeah. I actually, when I was demoing this at Apple before all of the releasing occurred. Um, I used that feature and it was really awesome. I, I, I did a I did a print a printout over the internet from California. My printer was at home and I had an IoT camera pointing at it. And <laughs> I printed to it and a little page came out and everybody was all excited. So it was very cool. Um, I just wanted to mention um, to Tom's point that yes, there are a lot of implementations of uh, various hacks that um, purport to make. Uh, multicast DNS work on multiple links and our experience with them um, is that frequently they don't work at all. Uh, sometimes they tease you by working a little bit and then failing. I've never seen one that actually works. So. Yeah, I just want to expand a little bit on the, the funny story that Ted told. He did this a demo for the guy in charge of our department and you wouldn't think it would make any difference because you could have a diagram on a slide with with boxes and arrows and things and saying the packets go here and this happens but there's something about the showmanship so <laughs> ted, ted ted had the live video on the screen of the little camera pointed at his printer at home and he tapped air print on his phone and we could see the piece of paper come out and the whole room erupted in applause it was amazing so maybe what we need more here is apple marketing <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it feels to me like there is some pretty good consensus in the room that there is still energy to do work and get documents published. Maybe not as a crazy fast rate, um, but that's okay. Um, so my sense is to keep this working group open, keep the mailing list open, and then maybe we'll have a shorter meeting um, in Singapore, we'll see by the time we get there, how many, or yeah, joint with HomeNet. That's, it, it'll depend on what we get on the agenda. So to our authors, please don't wait till the day before the meeting to send us your agenda items. That would be particularly helpful in scheduling us this time for how much time we wanna have. Um, Do you have anything else to add? Okay. You've said it all. Uh, all right, then we'll wrap is there, up. Is oh. there anyone else? Anyone else have anything they want to uh, mention? I really don't want to prolong this. This is Ted again. But, but uh, what I actually think is going to wind up on the agenda for Singapore is a, product, is a presentation about um, how we're using this stuff in HomeNet. So it will actually not really be a HomeNet thing or a DNSSD thing, but a both thing. How fitting. Uh, has anyone not signed the blue sheets? Which are there by Ted. Oh, yeah. 
And so to wrap up, I think uh, we got some inf we got a good information about the two upcoming documents, the ones that are almost published. So we're gonna discuss those more on the list and hopefully with that renewed energy, we're gonna get them published, which is great. And then Christian's gonna revive the privacy requirements document. So hopefully we'll actually see you on the list and not just in Singapore. And um, hope to see you soon there. Thanks for coming. And thank you to our note takers, Michael and Christian number two or one, not sure which order to put you in. <laughs> and to Tim for Jabber. <laughs> Nope, you still have a job. Yeah. <laughs> this week? Yeah. This week? I was I was going to be out of a job. No, but you look at the book that I have. You open it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh, I mean, well, that's the thing. We're both involved. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they're changing that? Oh, okay. Because I just put everything in part one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like this. It's like the SCP. All my packets are important. <laughs> I'm afraid of the